Welcome to the Mobile Games Playbook in association with Liftoff. Join us as we uncover the latest trends in user acquisition, monetization, and mobile game design. Hello, and welcome to the Mobile Games Playbook. Thanks for tuning in for another episode. This is the podcast all about what makes a great mobile game, what is and isn't working for mobile game designers, and all of the latest trends. I'm your host, John Jordan, and joining me today, we have no less than three experts from uh, Game Refinery. So uh, welcome uh, to uh, Kale Helkinen, Ono Kiski, and uh, Yari Sarinin. And I think, Yari, first time first time on the podcast, so a uh, partic- particular welcome to you. Uh, yes. <laughs> right, so in terms of uh, today's episode, we are going to be looking um, sort of broadly at uh, live ops, but we are going to be looking at them um, in the sort of context of the uh, Mobile uh, Game Dev Awards um, from Liftoff. Um, Now into their third year, they are um, looking at the power of live ops, obviously in terms of things like boosting player engagement and uh, monetization. So we're going to be sort of breaking down uh, the um, sort of live ops uh, ecosystem in terms of some of those categories. So we have stuff like collaboration, competition, immersive narrative, seasonal events and uh, and mini games. So we're going to be looking at those in in that context. But uh, maybe to to kick us off, um, Erno, can you sort of talk broadly about, you know, some of the stuff we've been seeing in, in live ops to just sort of contextualize? what we're going to be going into yeah sure maybe like just to start off like first of all like uh why we decided to move in uh, with our awards like you say this third time we're doing it and now we kind of like reiterate a little bit to focus just on the live events because well to be honest (laughs) there are all kinds of awards and uh, different types of awards and we were thinking about like how could maybe we you know differentiate from the from the rest of the best game of the year type of things and, and stuff like that. And as we know, where the market is, like where the fo- lot of the focus in the market is, and also what we have been doing in Game Refinery, a lot of our like recent additions and tools and focus has been on live events. So how about we actually specify, a bit, be a bit more specific and actually look just on the live events side of things and what is happening there and who is innovating and who is doing interesting stuff because to be honest uh most of the innovation nowadays in the mobile game markets or like a lot of the innovation actually happens in the event space there are a lot of the same old games still in the market but in the event space there's the innovation and new stuff happening much more often than maybe new games appearing which of course once in a while uh, still come <laughs> not that much but once in a while once in a while well monopoly go one of the biggest launches ever so no so of course like there are still those but but anyways so uh when we think about live events and how would i like categorize live events and how we think about live events and how we made these categories for example so of course when you're adding live events it all comes down to do like what is what is your goal what what are your aim with the event so it can be so varied so it can be that okay you're aiming to increase the retention uh, are you aiming to increase like long-term retention are you trying to create a, like a month months long like events that are maybe connected to some other events or are you like trying to you see in your data that let's say you have a weekly like a loop and then on on mondays it's always like people are dropping off and are not very engaged so what could we do in order to kind of like increase uh retention or engagement for those days for like short term as an example or if it's just like you are trying to increase daily play time so you see that okay uh, our like session lengths are could be longer you are like creating events that have then like maybe more sense of urgency if we are thinking about like the top dogs like royal match they have these events that you activate and then it's active for one hour and that's very kind of like an engaging short-term sense of urgency type of a type of an event is it about monetization are you trying to like directly monetize like you know have some like you know different kind of bundles or then of course like battle pass tying the engagement in the monetization or are you thinking about that okay i'm gonna actually indirectly need to want to increase the monetization so through the retention through the engagement and then like exposing to players your usual like uh monetization hooks uh like for example a lot of the match three games does all of their events they are not necessarily directly monetized but they 
very very cleverly like engage the users uh, in order to buy those extra moves and buy those like boosters and stuff like that or if it's like you're catering you're like looking at your user base and you're seeing that okay we're not catering to specific motivations enough so if you think about like social uh, motivation as, as an example so let's say we have a great game but we could uh, like uh, increase our uh, motivational kind of like a uh, how it like induces different motivational drivers is like we would need a little bit more social in our game we would need maybe uh, competition in our game for the more competitive like uh, players in our game or incentivize them through that or maybe co cooperation something like that is happening uh, in in some of those some of those games so this kind of like a motivational thinking or then even like you Adrian thinking we have been talking about a lot about like mini games and and mini games is one of the topics that has been talked about a lot and lot and if you look at like top especially like strategy games mid core hardcore games a lot of them are pushing events also not just to engage and monetize the users but they are working together with the marketing department and creating these kind of like a mini games and that kind of stuff and events and uh, stuff that they kind of can tie into their ua uh, efforts we're going to talk about mini games more in in the in the section when we discuss about the different categories but that's just like a couple of examples. So there are so many ways that you can think about live events and what is your goal? I guess that's the, the, the key thing. And then even on top of that, when you decide, okay, this is what we are trying to do. What, this is what we try to achieve with the events. But then also like how that event interconnects with your whole game and your whole gameplay loop. So like it's such an important thing to not just like slap <laughs> slap an event top of or like a, you see a, like a event in a top game and oh that's cool, but then it's a totally different game thing in your game how it interconnects with all the other events and how it fits into your whole like event framework. I think well uh, like couple examples like great example like Royal Match again you know how they. They have a, like a quite strict weekly framework, but how everything is so interconnected and kind of like gives these extra pushes to play another event and then play this another event. And for example, they just released their latest new event type called Archery Arena like week ago, half, week and a half ago. And it's kind of like a leaderboard event, but then it has this like win streak implemented into it and it's a one day event so again if you think about those things like what it tries to achieve okay it's a one day event so there's much more sense of urgency it always happens during the week and it gives that kind of like a every single day of the week and an extra push then there's the win streak kind of like a loss aversion tied into it so there's this kind of like a uh, another there are like multiple of these like i guess like five to six different things that you lose if you lose a level or if you keep the win streak going, you get extra benefits that is tied to it. So it's kind of like a taps into that. And then it ties, ties again into the monetization. So you want to compete, you want to complete the levels, you don't want to lose the win streak, so you get the score. So then it ties into the monetization. So this type of a thing, like how it you know, interconnects with the rest of the events that you have and the whole, whole game you have. Definitely enough there for an award. <laughs> for an award. <laughs> whole award <laughs> no, but I think it's a good, a good point you, you do say there, where certainly sort of from the outside looking in and not a very deep level to some of these games, um, then sometimes it can, they can seem very much like, oh, they've, they've gone down like the catalogue of, of live ops and I'll have, I'll have one of those and two of those and I'll slap that in. And, and, it, yeah. and it is, you know, I think without sort of like telling everyone to use your tools, you know, unless you really have a very deep understanding of how these games are being played, that it just seems a little bit sort of chaotic and you can't really see, it. you know, the, the gearing of how all these things, when they work in a sort of flywheel, really do work well. It's, it's especially like more mid-core, hardcore you go, more stuff there has started to happen. Like, for example, I've been just recently studying the the probably the most highest scaling Forex game in the past year, Whiteout Survival, and their live event framework. At first, it like for a couple of weeks, it feels that there's so much going on and stuff happening all the time and all the time. But when you like follow it for a longer pattern and longer time, you start to see those patterns that, ah, okay, this is why they have these on the same time. And you start to see that, okay, this event actually reiterates every two weeks or every three weeks. And this one is every week. And you kind of see these patterns and try to kind of like a, actually deconstruct that why 
their event framework work like that and why it actually works you know what is the why they work together so that's very interesting part about like deconstructing and analyzing <laughs> these top top games okay so we'll uh, we'll be doing that as we go through so we're going to take some we're going to take these categories um and uh, and go through them in a bit more depth so first one we're looking at is uh, collaboration so uh Kelly, do you want to take us through that yes so just uh adding to the great list that uh erno uh just explained on <clears throat> the different kinds of objectives that uh developers might have when building these events. So virality is definitely one of them related to what Eno just talked about uh, regarding marketing efforts. So so how much social shares do you get for your events and how much is it so, uh, shared in social media? And uh, these collaboration events are definitely something um, that if successful, do get a lot of attention from your uh, player base. Uh, so IP collaborations, obviously they have to major potential benefits for your uh, for your game. So you get to re-engage your existing player base, but then at the same time, it's a possibility to acquire totally new audiences as well. And as a developer, you want to achieve both, of course, but depending on the game, depending on the crossover IPs type, the focus then might be uh, more, for example, on the re-engagement side, as opposed to your user acquisition, or then it's the other way around. But anyways, in general, um, I would say that games shouldn't be too conservative when considering considering these different IP crossover brands. I think we've seen some pretty wild combinations that have been greatly successful. Like just recently, um, Lords Mobile is collaborating with uh, this car brand Pagani, for example, and we've seen Gucci in Tennis Clash and so on. But I, I guess it's safe to say that we do see a bit more gaming and, for example, anime-related collaboration events on the mid-core side. And then it's more common to see, let's say, celebrities or consumer brands and popular movies, for example, collaborating in, in the casual space then. And, of course, um, in, in the casual side, if we now go to the winners that we have in the Game Finery uh, Awards, uh, they're the winner for the best IP collaboration uh, events was actually Stumble Guys. We didn't choose that just for one specific uh, event, but I think it's safe to say that nowadays if we think about Stumble Guys, the IP collaboration events that they have, they're pretty much one of their key cornerstones if we think about their live up strategy overall. Uh, so they are, you know, out there with, for example, Fortnite on always having some 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 kind of interesting collaboration event going on with IPs like Mr. Beast, Monopoly, and, and Barbie, just to name a few. And then on the mid-core side, uh, our winner was uh, PUBG Mobile. And there we were especially thinking about the Dragon Ball event that they had, which was really cool how they implemented the, um, the limited time mode there. It was not just having some Dragon Ball uh, skins for players to purchase, but actually the entire mode was all revamped to be a drag, real Dragon Ball uh, experience, uh, like starting from the uh, graphics and aesthetics to all the other content that there was in the in the mode. So that was really really special moment for the game. Yeah, maybe on my my two cents on these two winners, uh, especially like uh, for the PUBG, uh, it's a like game, and overall shooters have been like. On the Western markets, of course, in the like like Asian markets, we have seen much more collaborations, even back in the day. But I think like in the Western markets, shooters were the one of the first ones to kind of like a really kick it in the next level, like with Fortnite, of course, and and all that stuff. And PUBG has been also there, especially on the mobile side, uh, collaborating with tons and tons of brands over over the years already. But with the Dragon Ball one, what I saw like. Um, looked into that uh, specific event like the production levels were like off the roof type of a thing so like uh, their whole game you know had a proper like dragon ball makeover and they were like proper like skills and you know changed the whole how you played the game for the sh short period uh, this kind of like a not just an event mode type of a thing, but this kind of like a whole movement of the game. Uh, everything kind of like a change, almost like a big, this kind of like a 
yeah big event happening i feel like uh, developers are like understanding that players appreciate like uh understanding the ip it's not just like a random just just a skin but like adding like more of the ip things into it like you have like in the PUBG, you could do like you know classic kamehamehas and whatnot so it feels more like you are actually understanding the call of ips and those are i think are pretty important and maybe in the party games maybe ip start to feel like they're like part of the core gameplay at like the core game so like players are always waiting like the new ip what's gonna come into the party games that is true and especially with the like stumble guys it's been so interesting to see like ever since it got acquired by scope how they have like went to the next gear went to the next gear in terms of the live ops and how it because when Stumble Guys came from Finland from a couple person team, and now it's this like uh, massive live ops machine where they have like such a big IP collaborations going basically all the time. If you follow it, it's there's always some collaboration going on. So it has become this like Yiri mentioned, this kind of like almost like a platforms of IPs like we have seen in Fortnite or Roblox or stuff like that. It's kind of like a crucial part of the whole whole experience and i guess that particularly works for where, where the game itself is sort of very simple which was obviously the way you know that game was sort of successful obviously it was a sort of a it was, it was looking at uh, uh bringing something to mobile that was on pc but uh but whether yeah you would think after a certain period of time that people will start to churn out if the game is that simple and you sort of, yeah it's, it's got obviously you're sort of playing co-op and you've got your friends in there and so there is that level as well but then it's really the what you're saying is sort of that level the sort of the collaboration is sort of providing the, the long-term engagement because you're just like I really love this game and what the exciting things gonna happen next week, next month. You know, you wanna stay there to see what the what the you know, what the IP engagement is. Yeah, definitely. And that like I would see like through the events, especially like the IPs and then the UGC stuff that has been now also been slowly added into Stumble Guys as well. And now the Egg Eggy Party, Stumble Guys main competitor from NetEase was just released where the like UGC is even on a next level, very slow start at the moment for the West at least, but like will be very interesting to see where that competition goes in the in the future. Good. Okay, so let's move on to the next uh, category, which is uh, social and competitive. All right. Uh, so social uh, and competitive overall, of course, this is a, a huge category because like you can look at it in many, many, many angles. So, uh, well, first of all, like social, one of the strongest retention drivers and glues uh, that keep players in, in the game. If they get a community, if they get a sense of competition going on, it can be one of the most engaging kind of like a motivational drivers that there, there, there can be, to be honest. So uh, it can be look at either like on the competitive side where you are like competing or then actually on the collaboration side. So for the winners of this category, we looked a little bit on the boat. So on the casual side, uh, we focus more on the collaboration. And in here, we chose the winner to be Monopoly Go with the partner events. So if you are an, unfamiliar with the partner events, uh, basically in those events, you are teaming up with other individual players and then you are progressing with them on, a, on like with the, like one on one. So two player teams, you are uh, progressing through the event, reaching point thresholds uh, and getting rewards uh, uh, and, and so on and so on. And then there's like an extra incentive if you are able to complete the event with all of the uh, all of the kind of like a four people you are teaming so you are making these two man teams with four four other people i think it was so if you're able to complete event with all of those then you actually get even an extra reward so you wanna like if you're a hardcore like engaged player you wanna like team up also with the other players who are very engaged but why we chose this one, because to be honest, uh, this type of a collaboration, even like we, even in this podcast, we have been talking a lot about like increasing competition in casual games for like years already. And it's been a trend for a while. But this type of a, like a collaboration, especially outside of the guild. So you are like teaming up in the start of the event and having doing that with just a friend event for just with individual friend so it feels a bit more personal than just like 
having a joint goal with the, like a 40 people guild or so on. So these type of events haven't been really that common yet. And now when Monopoly Go implemented the first iteration of this event, I think it was, was it in the summer, if I'm not, if I'm correct, uh, summer of last year. And then they have had it like once a month, every, every single, uh, every single month, uh, about five to six day uh, event, something like that. And very often on that, those days when this partner event has been active, has been the best poor performing days of the month for the game. That's of course a one, like in terms of like, we are seeing the correlations of the performance with this uh, kind of like a social event. But also we have seen that this exact event type, like so often with the casual game events, when somebody comes up with a specific type of a, like a format, it starts to pop, pop up all over the casual market. So now Monopoly Go brought this. Now the same idea has been brought to Royal Match, brought to Phase 10, uh, Clockmaker, just to name a few, few. So all kind of a different kind of like a core gameplay, not just like casual casinos, but also like puzzle games and stuff like that. But the same fundamental idea of this social collaboration event that they did that worked really well for them. And now it's been like spreading and it's kind of like a trend already, like one of the trending event types in the, in the casual. So definitely worthy of like uh, the winner, winner spot over here. And then uh, on the mid core side, uh, we have League of Legends, uh, Wild Rift, uh, implementing an event called Arena. So Arena was a, like a new PvP mode. And why especially we uh, wanted to highlight this one for this uh, category was that it's a good example of a developer trying something out, getting a really good feedback, probably seeing good numbers in terms of engagement at least, and then actually developing it further and implementing it as a like a proper like a permanent mode in the game so this pvp mode that they uh, like released called arena first came as a like a test it was an event limited time event that was was around for a while but it was so well received that now riot has actually developed it into a proper permanent part of the game that is over there, it has its own ranked uh, mode and everything like that. So great example of this kind of like a testing out something and then seeing the results and then moving on to kind of like a proper, like a feature uh, implementation. Yeah, I, I was just, just, just to add that it's kind of a, like a testament to the powerfulness of, uh, of events in general that you can test out your ideas, your concepts, uh, see how they perform, how players react, uh, do they engage with the event, and uh, in the best possible scenario, if it makes sense, then you can do things like in Wild Rift, you can make that uh, temporary mode a permanent uh, feature in the in the game. Okay, so now moving on, uh, I guess to what we see as sort of the, the first thing we had with Liveox was sort of seasonal events, so um, still going strong. Um, Kelly, what do you want to tell us about the winners on seasonal seasonal events? Yeah, I, I mean, I think when uh, people think about live events in general, uh, seasonal events like Halloween or Christmas probably come to your mind straight away. It's kind of a low-hanging fruit out there. You know, we need a summer event or a Halloween event to our game and, and so on. Uh, and obviously, you can make any event a seasonal event if an... Uh, event is a Halloween event. It really doesn't tell anything about the nature of the event, just that it's themed around Halloween. And um, I think that's one of the reasons why we feel, why I feel we see a lot of reskins of existing events, which with just a seasonal wrapping. Uh, so you change the name of the event to Halloween event. And let's say if it's a mastery game, uh, you match pumpkins instead of regular pieces. And obviously nothing wrong with that, of course. And if you've had your game running for a longer period of time already, then you can obviously start uh, recycling some of the ideas and the mechanics and the assets assets you've used in previous years. So just as an, as an example of that, 
Merch Mansion, the, one of the most popular Merch 2 games out there, they actually had a limited time store open during uh, Christmas time where they sold their catalog cosmetics from previous year's Christmas events. So players could then uh, purchase some of the cosmetics they probably have, they might have missed in the previous, uh, previous years. Uh, but yes, the, the winner uh, in this year's uh, awards for the best seasonal event in the casual side was Phase 10, already mentioned in, the, in this podcast. Uh, they really had a versatile package for their um, um, holiday event. So it really had a bunch of something for every, any, everyone. So there was a mini game going on. They had a renovation event, uh, a competitive event, social co-op event, uh, and even some slots elements incorporated uh, into the event. So really a, a nice uh, package uh, for, the, for the Christmas. Uh, so yeah, the, for, for the phase 10, I just want to say that overall, it's a very interesting game to, if you're like working in casual space, it's definitely a game to look into about live ops, because like Kalle mentioned, a lot of, the, especially casual live ops, there are a lot of these patterns that, you know, maybe, you know, the only seasonal thing is that, okay, your battle pass is now a, you know, a Christmas battle pass and, and it's a UI risk in of an existing event. And a lot of that is happening. And like I said, nothing wrong with that. And it, of course, makes all the sense if you have a strong event framework. But Phase 10 is a, like a very exceptional game in that sense that they innovate a lot and brought different kind of like a, uh, gameplay mechanics and uh, like event mechanics and stuff like that, maybe more than any other like these top performing uh, casual uh, casual games. So definitely a game to kind of like a peek into if interested in like var- variety and var- like variety in the in the live events. I guess one thing that just in general about seasonal events that I would add is that um, I, like if I would have to give one uh, tip, that would be to really think about which seasonal events uh, to address in your game. So I would definitely look at which geos are uh, most relevant uh, to your game. And then uh, not only that, but also that if there are any sizable uh, ethnic minorities in some of the uh, geos that are played uh, uh, in the game. And so then obviously then how to implement those, let's say Dragon Boat Festival events and Diwali uh, uh, events then definitely uh, doing some shilling here, but um, uh, definitely I would look for uh, Game Refinery's implementation database and and look for examples on all. We basically have all the relevant seasonal events uh, covered over there, so definitely a good source for inspiration. Cool. Have we finished seasonal? Do you want to go? Do you want to talk the mid core winner? Well, let's finish this up. We can go to mid- mini games already. Okay. Cool. So there we go. Uh, <laughs> oh no. You... Mini games. Yes, mini games, mini games. So, like I already mentioned, uh, it's an interesting trend. So, something that we, you know, have been talking about in the industry quite a bit, and for a good reason. So, if like talked about a little, but like what we mean by mini game and how, for example, I think about mini games. Uh, again, there's such a variety of mini game implementations, and also coming back to the motivations of like implementation. So with mini games, especially we have seen the approaches for the like UA driven mini games and UA driven like mini game modes and mini game events like like I talked about pretty much all the currently in the current market landscape scaling like hardcore uh, mid core uh, like forex strategy type of a uh, type of a games pretty much all of them if you look at the recent hits have been doing something in this space so some kind of like a more casually appealing maybe mini games ap- implemented into the game and and stuff like that but also in the casual side w- one very good example a very interesting example is a game called happy match cafe it's part of this uh trending trending subgenre of 3d match which what it, what i mean by that is the games like triple match 3d or match factory that came from zynga just recently so this game these like puzzle games where you have a pile of items where you need to find similar items from the like the 
pile of 3D items and then clear the board type of a thing or find the specific items to complete the levels and so on and so on. So there is this uh, game called Happy Match Cafe, which is like on the top, uh, I think it's like top crops in 50 game in the US and doing very, very well, uh, originates from China. Uh, but one very interesting thing in terms of mini games is what they do is that they have actually uh, mini games as a permanent part of the game when you complete those like 3d match levels then on the side you also have a progression for the mini game levels and what is even more interesting about that is that that mini game that you have in your game is dictated by when you downloaded the app and what was the UA campaign active at the time. So for example, uh, we did this like analysis of this game a while ago. So when I downloaded the game, there was this very beautiful pimple pop popping type of a mini game, which they uh, probably everybody has seen some of those ads, but they were using that. And that was a mini game in the game for me. But now if you go, for example, to Happy Match Cafe's App Store page, now they actually are advertising with this like uh, uh, draw, draw a line or like draw a, like a drawing without lifting your finger or like solve the puzzle without lifting your finger type of a mini game. And now if you download the app, that is actually the mini game that you get. And I still have that old mini game. So they are tying and changing the kind of like a mini game based on uh, the UA campaign, which they change. They see that, okay, this is like probably testing out, testing it out, seeing that this is a like a campaign that seems to be working. Then they are creating the mini game. Then it's part of the part of the part of the game permanently and doing this kind of like a evolving, changing mini games in the game and so on. So very interesting uh, tactics that uh, they have. But then, if we think about on the other side of the spectrum, so if that is, to be honest, the main goal is UA driven, uh, then on the other side of the spectrum, we have the mini game events that are aiming for retention and engagement. And that is also like more important than ever when the user acquisition is harder than ever. So if we look at the top games and especially, you know, the top of the chart game, so the mega games, so on, they are, of course, they are getting bigger and bigger and they are slowly turning, to be honest, in these kind of like almost like platforms offering variety of experience. If you think about like Play Ricks, they have a different kind of like, it's not just a match three game anymore. They have merge and they have exploration and all that kind of stuff uh, implemented, implemented in there. But also in a smaller scale, if you think about uh, other type of like games like Royal Match, they have had this like digging mini games that you are like digging treasures uh, uh, out of the board or uh, stuff like that. This type of a, a bit more smaller scale uh, kind of like a mini games, but mini games after all. And these are there to kind of like offer a little bit of a vari variety for, for the game. And in here also, like we I discussed in the start of this podcast, like the important thing is like thinking about how the mini game fits in your game loop. So, and what is the goal? So do you want to just add a fun mini game that keeps players engaged for like one day and then they throw it out? Or do you want to create a mini game event that becomes a part of your whole event loop and reoccurs and it's actually interconnected into your gameplay loop. So there's actually reasons for players to engage after the initial kind of like, oh, this is cool, something something other mini game kind of like a fades, fades out. So th this also like super important to think. And then if we go into the winners who I think kind of like a tap into these aspects. So for the winner, for the casual, uh, we have Royal Match, like talked about already. And they have been adding these, like I mentioned, the Digi mini game called Hidden Temple. They added already in the start of the year. Uh, and that event type, again, a bit similarly what I talked about with Monopoly Go, has been a trend. So this Digi mini game that Royal Match implemented also has been popping up in tons of different various uh, casual games from like Chrome Valley Customs and, and even actually Monopoly Go added this Digi mini game. So they are like <laughs> going back and forth, uh, like ideating and then taking the idea from the other and these top games uh, uh, 
uh, with, with the mini games. But the one we, we chose for a winner, we haven't really yet seen in m many of the other games, uh, was a Royal Matches event called Magic Cauldron, which was added, I think, in the like September, October, in somewhere over there for the first time. And it's been happening ever since then, once a week. So it's part of the weekly framework. And how that event works is that you are actually solving these formula puzzles. You have potions of different color, and there's only one right solution on which order you need to put those puzzles. And then if you put those, uh, sorry, uh, sorry, the potions. So if you put those potions in a specific order, then the, like the game tells that, okay, these ones were on the right spot and these were in the wrong spot. So what does this remind of, uh, like anyone? So of course it reminds of the like viral hit Wordle. So with that game, of course, it was like all about that you need to figure out the letters on the right spots. But here it's like different colored potions. And you have this kind of like a Wordle-like mini game. And then how that is interconnected to the whole gameplay experience that you get those potions by playing the core gameplay. So you are earning those potions and then you need to play more levels to get those potions and give that engagement loop. And then again, kind of like a fits to the whole whole kind of like a match tree game and creates those en extra engagement incentives and, and, and so on and so on. So great, great uh, like implementation and, and, and very engaging in my opinion, uh, this kind of like a mini game to extra incentivize a match tree player as an example. And then on the mid core side, uh, we chose Garena Free Fire uh, with the gay event called Pet Smash. Uh, maybe Yiri can uh, talk a little bit more on this one, but maybe the one thing that I want to highlight over here again is the interconnection. So Garena Free Fire is a shooter game and they have all kinds of different cosmetics and they have this, have had these pets in the game for a long time already. Uh, you can get your pets that follows you and so on. So now they brought an event that utilizes those pets. So you can like gives more reasons for you to, you to have the cool pets and you actually engage with the pets more, gives more value for the cosmetics and so on. But maybe Yuri can talk a little bit more about the, about the, the mode itself. Yeah, like in the mode you play, there was like a three pets that you could choose from. And uh, it was kind of like a Brawl Stars copy, if, like typical, you know, you, you have uh, two sides and three players on both sides and you try to kill each other's pets kind of using different kind of abilities and whatnot, each pet had their own. But like the reason why we chose this one but, uh, is because in like uh, free fires, like the whole live ops thing, like they always, well, almost always have like event calendars that are themed to, you know, to like certain season or some other things. And this event was like a part of this team calendar. So playing the mini game event, you could also like, there was some couple task missions that would kind of link with this mini game. So more reason to play the mini game. Yeah, again, like in terms of like interconnecting it with like not just a mini, mini game that is slapped on top, but it's very thought out on, okay, we're going to bring a mini game. It might be engaging, refreshing, but then how it fits in the grand scheme of things uh, where like in Garena Free for so much events of different kinds of events and then how you connect those and make everything engaging that they work as an ecosystem, so to speak. Having a shooter and having pets in there, I mean, that really seems like a jarring sort of thing, but now sort of pets are in everything. So it's sort of, I guess as the industry has sort of moved, as sort of what players expect to have in games, it's sort of broken out from the genres, like suddenly like pets in shooter games, just like, yep, why not? That's, yes. <laughs> sort of shows how these things are becoming, I mean, in, in another way, sort of platforms for, for um, sort of narratives and stuff. Okay, so uh, final category uh, is going to be narrative. And uh, Kale, you're going to take us through that one. So the winner for the best narrative event this year uh, in the mid course section uh, was Cooking Run Kingdom with their Holiday Express event. So Cookie Run Kingdom celebrated uh, the latest holiday period with an interactive story event, which was heavily inspired by Agatha Christie novels. In the event, players uh, were following this storyline and collecting objects from different rooms so that they could present the right evidence, as to say, in this murder case for the character Old Jolly. And 
what we would like to say in general about Cookie One Kingdom is that they're just excellent at using narrative elements in uh, helping uh, players to build bonds with the characters in the game. Uh, but amongst all the events that they've had in the in the last year, this particular event, so the Holiday Express event, really stood out for uh, for us. And on the casual side, uh, the winner we chose was June's Journey uh, with their story first battle pass. Uh, so June's Journey uh, finally jumped on to the uh, season pass battle pass wagon uh, last year with the travel pass uh, event that happened last November, uh, and it stood out for us as the best a narrative uh, event in casual, uh, mostly due to its innovative approach to emphasize storytelling in the season pass uh, format. So narrative aspects were really at the forefront of this travel pass uh, uh, feature. And, and you could say that getting rewards from the past was, you could pretty much almost consider that as the side benefit. The main beef was really to engage with the storyline. Uh, and what also made this pass very unique was the player's ability to influence uh, specific uh, narrative uh, um, segments by making choices uh, in the battle passes uh, narrative storyline. So that really added uh, sort of a layer of interactivity and connection for the players to deter towards uh, the event. Yeah, that that is very interesting, especially the 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 June journey one. I guess like Wuga has always been that's been their thing narrative. They've always been known for like creating narrative things, and 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 especially with June journey, it's one of the things that it stand out from the market was the emphasis on the narrative. And now they have had different kind of events that they have like added narrative more than maybe other casual games into their events. But very interestingly now. Battle Pass, like previous previous iterations we have seen, usually don't really, it's not narrative feature, so to speak. But now with their implementation, it was like, that's the, yeah, that is in the forefront. You are like, it's, I can I think it's called Travels. So it's always when a new season comes, it's a new story that you go, go and progress. And then you can, like Kalla said, you can like have a like impact even on the story by making the dialogue choices and stuff like that. Something a little bit similar we have seen earlier on, like Kalle mentioned earlier, the merge game, uh, Gossip Harbor, they have had uh, like battle pass, like small uh, nuggets of like dialogue, but not into that scale, I think that Vuga does. But they also had that, okay, if you want to get the kind of like a, juiciest part of the story that's on the premium layer of the battle pass so that was like one of the things that they tried to sell in order to buy the premium layer of the battle pass you are progressing in the same manner and getting rewards but like narrative as a reward for a battle pass so that's an interesting new type of an implementations happening on that space over the whole over everything we've spoken about we've gone into a lot of detail on some of these games but it, it sort of shows you know, the, the whole, yeah, yeah, how much innovation there is. And some some of it's, I guess, just good sort of best practice, really well implemented and not maybe innovative in terms of, you know, coming up with something new. It's sort of using the tools that everyone has available in a, in a really good way for the audience and for the game. And But it's still fascinating to see people coming up with these you know, innovative ways of, 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 yeah, sort of using a battle pass. We, we thought we'd seen everything in a battle pass over the last, whatever, five years and now suddenly... You know, a very specific implementation for that very specific sort of game, as you said. Um, really fascinating to see. Um, so thank you, everyone. We, we've covered a lot of ground there. I hope people are enjoying that. I hope you're going to download these games and, and, and check them out. You, you've had a, a lot of pointers there, so that's a really fascinating call to action. Um, so uh, thank you uh, to Erno, uh, Kelle and uh, uh, Yari. Um, Yuri, even sorry, get it right at the end. <laughs> Finally, yeah, <that's> right. <laughs> for your expertise, um, and uh, thank you uh, to uh, you for watching, listening uh, to the podcast. Um, every episode, we are you know doing these deep dives into the into the mobile games industry, which is, remains as fascinating as ever. In whatever we are now, twelve years, twelve years into the free to play um, uh, mobile gaming uh, industry, and, and it's still uh, expanding and still really fascinating. So I hope you are subscribed, and I hope you'll come back next time. Uh, but uh, thank you very much for listening to this one. See you then. Bye-bye.